Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa, why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you can do. Pod for Good is produced and edited by Rant9 Productions and can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm your chief philanthropod, Jesse Ulrich. And I'm your vice admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. And today our guests are Laurel and Riley Carbone Kern, founders of Tallgrass Estate Planning. Their goal was to create a different kind of law firm, one that reaches out to people who are routinely overlooked by traditional law firms or people who are hesitant to work with traditional law firms. We talked to Riley and Laurel about social justice through estate planning, the Lord of the Rings, and why everyone needs estate planning. Even Sauron the Deceiver. Enjoy. We are very excited to have Riley and Laurel Carbone Kern from Tallgrass Estate Planning on the podcast today. Hello, both of you. Hello, Why, both hello. of you. Hello. Mainly Chris. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Chris is definitely that. the mo- more popular of the two of us. Yeah. I would say. Yes, he gets all the attention. <laughs> yeah, well, the hello. Yeah. Listen, we we yeah. fight over the attention. That's always been our problem. Man, I relate to that. All right. I don't have to fight. For our listeners, they're going to be asking at this point why we are, are having an estate planning company on the podcast. So we'll start with the most basic question, which is, how is estate planning a social justice issue? So I, I recognize that estate planning sounds like, feels like, smells like the most untoasted white bread topic anyone has ever thought about. We are as spicy as mayonnaise. Yeah. Yes. I hate mayonnaise. However, we are grateful to be able to do a fair amount of of pro bono, low bono work. And we see in that practice, a number of things pop up like over and over and over again, people who their, their grandparents, their great grandparents owned a piece of property and then didn't know about estate planning. And so now they're in a situation where like 15 people own it um, to be able to like apply for grants for certain things. They would need to track all of them down or pay for a quiet title action. It should be something that is giving them wealth and security, but instead it's costing them money to have this asset. And if you know what estate planning is, if you're willing to hear about it and learn about it, um, it can really... uh, enhanced generational wealth for for not just, you know, middle class America or or upper class America, but like literally everyone. And that's why it's so important to us to help people understand, look, estate planning is for every single person. The the misconception is that estate planning is about figuring out who gets your stuff when you die. And there's a whole lot of people who look at their lives and think, I don't have stuff. So who cares? Um, that's, that's a wrong understanding of what it is. It's really just about making sure that the right people are in control at the right times of the right things. And what we see your, your question about it being a social justice issue is that there are massive disparities in who plans for that kind of control. And because all of us, no matter what our demographic, uh, you know, racial status, religious status, nationality, etc. All of us are subject to losing that control because of disability and death. Because of the disparity in who plans, there's also a disparity in generational wealth and the influence, political influence, financial prosperity that come along with that. So over generations, you see the disparity uh, linked to, you know, what we think of as, as, a, as a pretty clear, as one example, um, reinforcement of systemic racism. Because disproportionately, people who have large amounts of money or larger amounts of money are thinking about doing estate planning, right? It has occurred to them, hey, I should probably do a power of attorney, get a trust in place, right? But the reason that they're doing that planning, the things that they see maybe happening down the uh, down the line in their lives and being possible those things are possible for every single person, regardless of how much you have. But if you have a plan in place, it's going to affect your life and your loved one's lives a lot differently um, than if you don't have that planning in place. So Chris and I have spoken to lots of people about just the multiple different ways that systemic racism and past sins of the United States mesh into the rest of society in ways that are not noticeable mostly to white people. And 
I would definitely say the generational wealth gap and the fact of like, say, for example, the Tulsa race massacre, the insurance money that black Tulsans didn't get when their their homes were burned down, that money could have been then inherited by their their children and their grandchildren over time. So not only did they have their own property destroyed, they had their future income from that property destroyed. And you yeah. that, that's hard for people to understand because we only think about it when it when it happens to us, right? Like, oh, I remember when we sold my grandmother's condo in Florida and like I got a thousand dollars, which seemed like a lot of money when I was a teenager. Yeah. And and but like those type of gifts over time, like over generations, you don't get those things. You don't have, you know, funds to fall back on. You don't have all these other things. What's amazing about like considering how the Tulsa race mass- massacre fits into this is, you know, Black Wall Street was thriving at a time 40 years before the law even really had created enough kind of equitable opportunity for uh, people who are black, communities who are black, to even really have enough access to capital to compete with their white counterparts. They were killing it before they really even had the legal opportunity to. What you have now, you know, fast forward 40 years to post-Civil Rights Act, you've got a generation of people who are black able to access capital, purchase property in a way that was, it, it, you know, at least on paper, had leveled the playing field. Although systemically it still had not, of course, but on paper, the law had been updated to allow people to accumulate capital in a, in a fair way. Here we are just 60 years later and you have a generation of folks who for the first time in American history, uh, black and people of color either dying or becoming disabled or retiring with capital for the first time in their family's history. And because of the disproportionate number of uh, black, indigenous and people of color who are not doing estate planning, that wealth is going to fall back to the state or it's going to get lost in court costs. And it's going to cost the next generation that much more to to catch up to where a lot of white communities, obviously, I mean, I'm fifth generation um, and, and just since the year 1900 in my family. And the advantages that that's brought me and my great grandfather, grandfather and father able to accumulate some social and financial and political capital is uh, is something I can't really measure. And what we want to see happen in our community um, everywhere, but certainly in Tulsa, is for our um, black, indigenous and, and people of color neighbors to to be able to access uh, these tools to ensure that whatever they have, no matter how little it is, is passed on to the next generation as efficiently and simply as possible so that um, those generational benefits of transferring even the smallest amount of wealth can start to accumulate. So how do you uh, connect with the the communities that you want to serve and reach out to? Well, I mean, we start off by trying to be very present in social media and letting people know like, Hey, listen, um, here's some free information. Um, we think estate planning is for everyone. We partner with a number of different organizations and say, listen, if you encounter somebody and you know that they need planning of some sort, if you come to us, uh, and say, Hey, go talk to this person. We, we will. You know, we absolutely will. If that means us, you know, going out to that person wherever they are, um, sometimes it's in the hospital or a field nursing facility. We try to make it as accessible as possible. We try to make it as understandable as possible. I will answer your questions for as long as you are interested to ask them. We try to elevate other voices in estate planning that are doing an amazing job. There are, I mean, any, any person or entity who's trying to do work in this space has got to choose are they are they better positioned to deal with an outcome or a root cause and the systemic racism work kind of needs to happen on both ends laurel and i are really we try to be thoughtful about kind of checking our our privilege as as kind of a white middle class couple it's it's not going to be very effective for us to sort of just march into north tulsa and say here we are, the white lawyers who are going to solve all your problems, right? That's that's We're not able to do that. And if we tried to do that, it would look ridiculous. It makes more sense to us to try to think about where the root of the problem is 
And one of the things that kind of keeps the disparity in place is the lack of information coming to those communities through credible voices and the lack of attorneys who are black or indigenous or people of color who are working with these communities. So one of the things we've tried to do rather than marching into churches in North Tulsa and leading seminars about, you know, um, estate planning for, for black people is instead to think, are there some young law students or young attorneys that we can talk to and mentor train on how to do this and then use their own voices and credibility to go into their own communities and start making this difference from the ground up. That's going to be a lot more effective long-term than the two of us saying, how can tall grass estate planning do your will? Because while I love tall grass and and I'm so proud of what we've built, my real goal is for this information to really get out to the people that need it. And however that needs to happen, whatever that needs to look like, if I can get that information, if I can get those tools to the hands of the people who really need to be able to use them, whoever gets the credit is unimportant. It's that they have the tools that matters. To be effective attorneys, especially in kind of an estate planning space, there are things we want all of our clients to know, feel, and do. We want them to know why estate planning is important. We want them to feel peace of mind for having done or anxiety for not having done it. Uh, The things we want them to do are effectively reach out to the appropriate people to help them implement a strategy. It very well could be that the disparities between white and black communities on who's doing estate planning exist along all three of those spectrums. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't feel. Maybe they can't do. So... Um, because there are a disproportionate number of estate planning attorneys who are white Mm -hmm. um, and estate planning sort of knowledge sources that are coming from kind of white voices, it makes a lot of sense to try to help mentor, you know, black and indigenous voices to, to start becoming authoritative centers of knowledge, but then also to be practitioners who can go into these communities and get the work done. And that we really want to long term our effect is not so much that we want to build a, a big book of business from people who are black as part of a tall grass estate planning model, but for tall grass estate planning attorneys to be mentors of young black and indigenous and people of color attorneys who want to get out and get this work done for their communities. Talking on the lawyer front, even even if law schools are trying to you know recruit more black or people of color or indigenous lawyers, like it's not necessarily that they would even know that this is a successful direction in which to go. They would go towards what I'm assuming is like the, what is considered the most profitable uh, type of lawyers being like a a criminal lawyer, right? Criminal defense, personal injury, family law, right? Those are the, that's what people think of as their bread and butter. And, And I think it's been pitched even, especially to marginalized community, that that's where their work needs to be focused because they don't have any estates to plan. And that's that's the the misconception we want to correct, not only in the public's mind, but also in the mind of some young lawyers and law students. Yeah. And I, I mean, we should be. So it is true that um, minority communities do plan less, but it's also true that people generally are not planning. Right. Yeah. So uh, I think it's true that the majority of people right now don't have estate planning documents in place. Per- like, period. Like. More than sixty percent, and and people are are beginning to plan less, right? And, and there's theories about why that's happening, um, but you know what happens is that then that family enters a crisis moment, and you know what happens in a crisis: you have fewer options, and all of them are more expensive than if you had been able to do that pre-planning. So yeah, no community is monolithic, right? White people do not move as a group. People who are black do not move as a group, Um, even if the information and the motivation was more evenly spread across different racial groups, there would still be plenty of black and indigenous and and, and people of color folks who didn't do any estate planning. So the idea is not um, white people have got this figured out and black people do not. It's white people are under planning, but more white folks are planning than black folks are. So. Um, if we do a better job of disseminating this information and offering the services, then more black folks will plan. We don't think it'll be all of them because the, again, the, the community is all of anyone. The community isn't monolithic. They don't move together. That's not how we, the problem is more nuanced, right? Than just who knows what, but we could certainly do better. 
and and getting the information out there is going to increase the likelihood that the statistically, um, you know, the the forty percent of people who are going to plan are pretty evenly distributed across different um, racial and ethnic groups. One of the one of the issues that's come up before on some of our podcasts has to do with how certain assets in the Black, Indigenous, people of color communities tend to be valued, yeah. especially real estate, which can also greatly impact generational wealth. Hugely. But even more so if it doesn't get to the next generation, right? So let's yeah. let's say you've got, and this is, you know, we've got real numbers here from a lot of our own clients in our community. You might have in certain neighborhoods, the median home value only be forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000 compared to hundred and hundred fifty thousand dollars in other neighborhoods. And because people think to themselves, well, my house isn't worth much, I shouldn't plan. What they have is now uh, a grandma whose house is paid for, she bought it for twenty thousand, now it's worth fifty thousand. Still not a ton of money. But if she doesn't plan appropriately, that fifty thousand dollar asset is not going to get to anybody effectively. Because if she doesn't plan and she's subject to something like probate, somebody's going to have to come up with enough money to hire a lawyer to get at that ac- a- asset. And if they don't, it gets lost. It goes back to the county. Um, it just becomes decrepit and, and, and it contributes to a loss of property values or, or home values around it, right? So we, t- we sometimes tell families that if you feel like you don't have much, it's even more important for you to transfer it effectively because the cost of administering your estate is going to be more, proportionally speaking, than administering the estate of somebody who has a million dollars in assets. Right. So we we do run into this, I mean, a lot. And so this is the part that's like, it's so boring that people's minds just turn into like a, a buzz of static. <laughs> <laughs> the eyes glaze over. Yeah. You know. But like the way that the laws of intestacy work, it can end up meaning that people who don't necessarily get along very well jointly own a piece of property that's perhaps not worth very much. So we had this where a stepsister owned one quarter of the property and then our client owned the other three quarters, right? Well, they couldn't get along. They couldn't agree who how much they should list it for or what real estate agent they should use. Or, I mean, they... The, the one was like, well, if we're going to make any repairs, you are going to have to pay for all of it because you know that I don't have any money to make. Well, yada, yada, yada. OK, so they ended up needing to go to partition this land. Right. Well, it was too small of a piece of land to partition. It was only purchased for six thousand dollars. Right. So they paid now to partition it. all the court costs involved in that. Then they have to pay. Uh, assessors to go out and determine if it could be partitioned, right? And then if so, like how much is the approximate value, et cetera. And then the court sells it, right? And attorneys are happening throughout all of this. And while I think attorneys are great shining stars in our society. Especially us. Uh huh. Definitely us. Um, I mean, you're, you're paying them. That's, you, you've and, essentially got a $5,000 piece of property that's got $20,000 in legal fees attached And to so it. if you, yeah, I mean, if you take that $6,000 property and we charge, say, $1,500 period for a quiet title, I don't care if it's worth a million dollars or if it's worth $6,000 between the publication costs and the court fees and just getting ourselves a little bit, $1,500, right? Well, like you said, you know, $1,500 to get $6,000 piece of property into your name that's a huge bite out of that value. And if, the, and if the niece or nephew who was wanting to inherit that property doesn't have that liquid cash to put up for the court costs, then that, that property disappears. So some of the statistics, and this is kind of shocking for a lot of people, if you don't plan and you have to go through some court controlled proceeding to get assets to the next generation, what you've created is some kind of a forced joint property ownership scheme for your family. Right now, just among um, identifiably black communities, there's about $6 billion worth of inherited property owned by multiple family members who don't get along and can't figure out how to manage this properly. And if they don't, if they don't find a way to manage those costs and work things out, that's billions of dollars worth of just real estate, not even talking about bank accounts, cash accounts, brokerage. But billions of dollars in black owned real estate that disappears and is going to inevitably fall back into white hands. And that's not even talking about the fact that that black owned property was probably undervalued to begin with due to, you know, 
Right. Multiple and different things as, wrong with our system. As soon as the white hands get back onto it, and it's 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 subject to available capital from those communities. Now we're talking about benefiting white communities and white supremacy by allowing us white folks to purchase undervalued property, fix it up, sell it off at a profit, build more equity for our families to pass on efficiently and continue to exacerbate the system. Josh, our helpful elf, has uh, slid me a note here uh, talking about how there is no benefit in systems that are structured by white supremacy to share the knowledge of estate planning um, because there's no if, if you're dealing with systemic racism, um, why would they want more people to have this information, right? It benefits white supremacy to not share it. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that estate planning, the the laws, at least the way they're built is on retaining wealth, right? right? And the laws in this country, flank, frankly, are designed to retain the wealth in white hands. I and that's, mean, that's but, huge, uh, right? So like, I mean, Richard yeah. Rothstein in The Color of Law, talks about how segregation isn't just about geography, right? It's not about a, a street or the, the wrong side of the tracks that divides white communities and black communities. There's all kinds of aspects of how our society works that are segregated. And most of them are not explicitly segregated. It's just kind of how things have shaken out. But the law is an area where until very recently, it was overtly uh you know, reinforcing white supremacy against black communities. And we are just a, just a generation behind us from explicit racism in the law, reinforcing white supremacy and segregation. And so it makes perfect sense to me as an attorney, as a white attorney, why a black family who is even thinking about estate planning is still going to hear me talk about this and go, I don't know if I should trust either the law or this lawyer because the law mm -hmm. is one of the areas in recent American history where racism has been overt. Well, I was going to ask about that because it it is in a lot of black indigenous people of color communities, they have seen the law used as a weapon against yeah. them. So you're trying to show them how to use the law as a tool to benefit them. How difficult is that? How difficult are those conversations? Hugely. Yes. I mean, we gra gradually through referrals, our, our demographic for clients has gotten more diverse. Um, but it's usually because they trust someone uh, and that someone trusted us. Right. Um, so once they come in, they're, I mean, willing to listen, willing to hear, excited to learn about some things that, you know, might really help. But um we were talking recently to our daughter who's 10 about you know, race, racism, systemic racism in America and helping her understand how she doesn't have to really go into any aspect of her life, any interaction and think about her race. She has got friends who are black uh, and, and indigenous and, and, and others that um, it has to be part of their thought process and how they're interacting with people. We see that with our clients who are also, you know, black or indigenous. We have a lot of white clients who come in here and we never even need to think about ethnicity, religion, culture. Um, we are all just kind of automatically speaking the same language. And there's a lot of things that are being accomplished without ever having to actually be directly addressed. Um, we have clients who are black, for instance, who maybe they've achieved a point in their life where they've got enough wealth that they know how to speak the language and they come in and we can, even with those families, we talk vaguely about the difference between kind of black with money or white with money. But where it becomes problematic to your question, and we really have to do a lot of trust building if we don't already have kind of borrowed credibility from another previous client, is, um, you know, that first generation homeowner with a decent income that's trying to plan for their kids, but is reasonably skeptical about how, this, how all this works. And there's a lot of trust building. Our first conversation with those folks are usually not tell us about your assets and your family. It's tell us about your feelings and your anxieties and what your previous experience with attorneys has been so that we can do a lot to overcome those things before we even start talking about planning. And all of that in my mind is perfectly rational and reasonable. I'm curious because I know we've talked a lot about passing on wealth and and you know having retaining control in the right instances is there an aspect of trying to 
grow that wealth from generation to generation as well. Sure. So a lot of our work, you know, we don't do financial planning. We're not accountants. I know some attorneys have tried to incorporate those things into their practices. We like being able to refer to other professionals to do like, I like to stay in my lane. I know this, not that. So it's common for clients to ask us for referrals to other trusted advisors. So when we have folks, young professionals who are black and and wanting to grow their wealth, then it's really important to us to have a network of other financial professionals that we can refer to that are, you know, if they're, you know, black owned financial planning businesses or CPA firms like Cindy McGee at Next Gen Tax, like we want to include those people as quickly as possible, not only to grow their businesses, because that's good for all of us, but also to help connect them to um, to people who are going to more automatically trust them with their money and their investment strategies. Yeah. I'm trying to think through the the idea, like, why would anyone in these communities trust? It's not even trusting you. It's trusting the law itself and the system, right? The system that is built around us. And I had a weird moment today when I like was sort of foreseeing the fact that I can no longer trust what people in government do, right? No matter yeah. who they are now, I can't. And that, like, that's been taken away from me. And then I was like, what does that feel like to have that knowledge shared with you like as a child? That like mm-hmm. you cannot trust what everyone else thinks is the system set to protect us. Like that system is not to protect you. And how you, how you sort of reshape the conversation to, you know, this, it, it's a tool and we can teach you how to use this tool to protect yourself. People have been using this tool to hurt you. But it can also be a tool that will protect you. But there's hundreds of years of of anger, deservedly, and concern about said system. To, to, I mean, it brings up some really important questions and issues, though. And there's not a lot we can do to directly change or even address those historic injustices. What we've tried to do in our own practice, at least, is create things in as much of a transparent way as possible. When when a marginalized person, and we've, we've gone out of our way to work with a handful of marginalized communities, and not just racial minorities, but also um, sexual and gender minorities and marginalized communities, LGBT folks, we do a lot of trans work, etc. But we are, you know, white, cishet, you know, folks. And that's just the truth of it. Those Those people come in and talk to us and they are very quickly thinking about what has been the the obvious barrier to getting this work done in a lot of scenarios, which is money. How much is this going to cost me? How are you going to charge me? How does that relate to how you charge other people? Am I am am, am I getting treated differently than my peers, etc.? We've tried really hard inside of our firm to have a flat fee structure, meaning we're not changing how we charge for different services, except that we may charge certain people less. We've Laurel and I have had a lot of conversations about the the degree to which how we arrange our fees for certain communities even represents a certain kind of our contribution to reparations. Should we be charging certain communities less than others just because of the community they come from? Um, but that's a you know Jesse your the, your comment that wasn't really a question does relate though to that kind of skepticism when they come in. I've been treated a certain way by other people, and I never know who to trust and who not to. So by being really transparent about our pricing model and how we do our services and then even telling them when we're giving them uh, much, you know, charging much less in terms of our fees as a as a way to help decrease that barrier, uh, reduce barriers to entry to get these kind of services. That's what we want to do. You brought up reparations, which not surprisingly over the last, you know, year or so has come up a lot on the podcast, both with the upcoming race massacre and, uh, you know, everything that happened uh, last summer. And I think to me, that's one of the, I think that for a lot of white people it's difficult for them to grasp is that the reparations are not saying, Hey, you have to pay someone because your ancestors did something bad. It's uh, the ancestors of people in these marginalized communities had their wealth destroyed generations ago and it was never passed on to them. So putting them to start at a position well behind many other communities. And so it, it sounds like that's that's kind of part and parcel with what you're tackling. Yeah, and because one of the, I think, a reasonable objection 
I mean, we are we are firmly on the side of of reparations. I think the the work that Reverend Turner has been doing and others have just been remarkable. But the uh, you know a, a political issue is going to be how in the world do you pay them? Is there's there's no like store of cash that it makes sense to just go start writing checks from? So one particular one idea is for you know professionals, uh, service providers who you know white owned businesses and white professionals to find a way to reduce the financial barriers of entry to these communities because they've been disadvantaged generationally. And it, it's a form of kind of paying reparation that's not about trying to say, I'm guilty because my ancestors are guilty, but to recognize that your ability to participate in this interaction is handicapped. And one of the ways that I, as a privileged a member of a privileged community, can relate to you as a member of a marginalized community is to do what I can, where I'm in control of price, to decrease that as a barrier to entry. I like I've I've always thought like a great idea is just like for I don't know, say twenty years, all indigenous people and black people and Latino people don't have to pay taxes, right? Yeah, yeah, awesome. No one likes paying taxes, right? Like I'm trying to think of something that could win over the the red staters, and like I mean they'll find they'll find something. <laughs> They'll find something wrong with that too, but if I got to pay I, taxes, so do you. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. yeah. But maybe that's how we get them to pay more taxes. There you go. It's like, we, we, we're <laughs> going to give them, you know, let them not pay taxes for 20 years, but now we are now you just need to pay a little more. Yeah. You, you have to be a large corporation that we're attack, attracting to the city to be able to not yeah. pay taxes for a period of time. <laughs> Let's not go on that rant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, do, do we need to bring up the highway yeah, system? Yeah, that's one of your rants, Jesse. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Tulsa's Tels- uh, tax base, Chris. <laughs> We're trying to hit all our hot yeah. buttons. Let's allow every black citizen of Tulsa to incorporate, Ooh. and then they will be the largest Ooh. corporation in Tulsa, That's and uh, we'll give them a tax break. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Give them a tax break, then, uh, yeah, they'll get all the benefits, all the big companies. Yeah, they're that, all holders in black ink, you know? That's yeah, they'll, 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 I like they'll fix that. those roads and, uh, you know. <laughs> put lights up pay for utilities yep. all everything yep. it'll be great yeah i mean like this is the the work you do and the what we're talking about you know is a weirdly enough like your the estate planning and the the laws and philosophy behind it have their fingers in a multiple different systemic racist it, issues and systems and law money yeah yeah all the things that are used to hurt them, right? These are all also things that could help them. Now that the law is a little more, the law itself is a little more colorblind than it once was, right? Yeah. It's still not perfect. No law is, no law written by a human being is perfect. But what, what is the one to five things you could tell us that all people <laughs> should know about sort of estate planning or protecting themselves? That's that's loaded. You know you're probably going to get an F five. No, no if you gave a range of one to five, oh, five. I, I, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go ahead and push that boundary, and we'll go to like seven or eight. Yeah, I, I, I figured that. I was trying. I was trying to. Uh, I was trying to put a, like a uh, some guardrails on the the amount. Powers of attorney are foundational documents. Every single person should have a power of attorney. Anybody over eighteen, uh, if you're one one of your gifts to your graduating seniors should be to get them a power of attorney. I mean, it just, it's the most, it's the most basic foundational. doesn't matter what you have, get yourself a power of attorney. Thing number one. Beyond that, although everyone has to have that. Has to. Has to have that. The rest of your estate planning will probably look different, right? Depending on what you're trying to do, who you are, right? So just because you hear one person uh, and they have, you know, two houses or something and they have an estate plan. Well, that's great for them, but you have a much smaller house and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You don't need an, yes, you do. It's going to maybe look different based on what you're trying to accomplish, but you do need an estate plan. So you need to talk to somebody um, about what that should look like for you, right? What kind of plan you need is not so much a matter of your net worth. I think this is a, another kind of, if we're going to call this number three, um, number one, everybody needs a power of attorney. Number two, what kind of plan you have is going to be different. Number three, the difference between your planning options is not going to be, are you worth more or less than $500,000 or a million dollars or $50,000? It's what are you trying to accomplish? Um, probably the one of the biggest misconceptions that we have to fight with, even, even with other financial professionals, 
is that the advice goes something like, if you're not worth this much money, then you don't need this particular tool. And because we're people who draft and implement these tools for folks all the time, we know that it's really not about how much you've got, but just what you're trying to accomplish. So get some really good counsel. Talk to somebody who knows what they're doing because you don't know what you don't know. And you may be you may be driving your own planning, your DIY strategy based on a complete misconception of how this works. The, the simplest example I can give you is that people think to themselves, if I've got a will, I will avoid probate. In Oklahoma and most states, a will requires court intervention at death. Having a will as your central planning tool is going to guarantee court involvement, not avoid it. Um, but if you haven't talked to the right people, you don't know that. Um, you thought to yourself, I don't have a million dollars, a will will be good enough without understanding that the administration of that is going to have court costs, attorney's fees tied up with it that are super easy to avoid. Riffing up a little, little bit off of like everybody needs an estate plan, long-term care costs are very expensive. Mm. And everybody says to themselves, well, you know, my kids are going to look out for me. And I don't think, I mean, they do want to, but for many people, right, more people than um, we wish were true, there may come a point where what your family can do for you at home is not going to be enough, right? And you need to embrace that conversation sooner rather than later because there are things that you can do. There's Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, right? So that the family home doesn't end up having to be sold to pay for long-term care. If you're the first right. member in your family to own a home, you don't have to lose it just because you needed to go to the nursing home. There are right. things called caregiver agreements where that daughter, that son, the, those kids that are coming over and making sure your house is clean, making sure there's groceries, making sure your pills are all figured out, taking you to every doctor appointment, they can be reimbursed for those costs. And it doesn't have to be that when you go to apply for Medicaid, you spend every single thing down and there's no money saved back. I mean, for you, so, you can you can push the money over to them. There are accept my point is there are acceptable ways to move that money around to protect wealth for yourself and for your family. But you need to have that counsel. You need to know that's possible. Everybody needs an estate plan. Everybody needs to have a conversation about long term care costs and what you're doing about it. And wealth here doesn't mean, you know, you you own the equivalent of Downton Abbey. In, in Tulsa, right? Well, wealth could literally be, and this is I'm like an actual client of ours. She's She's got a house that's worth $60,000 that's paid for, and she's got her social security. She's in her late 50s, and she's got a housemate that's not a member of her family, um, a person who herself is kind of in a, a, a marginalized community. The owner of the home is afraid that if she needs long-term care, She's going to have to lose the house, spend it down, and then her housemate will be homeless. In her case, we can do a very easy instrument to preserve that house if she needs long-term care and even use some of her Social Security right now to set over into a kind of account that Medicaid would never count against her. So there's a small amount of cash and real estate that doesn't get lost just because she gets sick. Um, and I guess if we were going to put number five on it, it would be that my family knows what I want is not an estate plan. I, I don't know how many times we might have a client, you know, young professionals who are like, you need to talk to my parents next. We're going to pull them in. And then we talk to dad who's a retiree and he's done everything on his own. And he's like, ah, my family knows what I want. It'll be fine. And knowledge of what you want is one thing. First of all, I question, does your family actually know what you want? It sounds like you don't talk about it very openly. But the second thing I would say is, um, Knowing what you want doesn't really matter legally. If you don't have the authority to get it done, it's not going to happen. Um, so passing along the right authority to the right people at the right time is way more important than just my family knows what I want. That's a state hoping, not a state planning. Because, I, I mean, you want to make two people hate each other for the rest of their lives. Have your son and daughter disagree about what should happen uh, in those last moments in the hospital. Mom would have made it if you had just if gone you hadn't ahead, told the doctor to pull the plug. Yeah, she would have made it, yeah. right? It doesn't matter that you have sat down at Thanksgiving uh, and said, well, honey, if anything ever happens to me, just let me go, okay? That relationship is going to be impacted. For decades. Because you, and you can stop that. Just do your planning, right? Or, or forcing two people to own a house together or maybe more um, because- 
you couldn't figure everything. out how to have this conversation. Yeah. yeah. Or or leaving everything to uh, your your daughter, but you really want it to take care of uh, your grandchild that has a special need, right? Well, she's, I'm, maybe she, your daughter wants to do that, right? But if she ever has a divorce, what happens? Is it available still to your granddaughter? Which is really what she wanted the whole time. So just saying, well, everybody knows what I want. Don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Maybe everybody does. But let's talk to an attorney and let's make sure that it's going to be able to work the way you want. We so there, There's a purple drink emergency. <laughs> yeah. You, you guys know, but... A lot of your listeners who haven't worked with us may not know we've uh, we've intentionally set up our um, law firm to be a home office, and our two smallest children are five and three, and are frequent visitors into our conversations. So this is just part and parcel to how we work for us to be in the middle of a very important conversation, and then somebody comes in and with a bathroom emergency. Really you know, needs purple drink right? or a good drink. Usually, it's Jesse running in when we no. were having an important conversation with a purple drink emergency or yeah. needing to go to the bathroom. So I was, I was going to ask which which one has your power of attorney, the five year old or the three year old? <laughs> Definitely the three year old. We were okay, yeah. our, our five year old Bruno. We love him, but we're not going to trust him with those decisions. <laughs> Prairie, on the other hand, is an old soul, and she's got wisdom beyond her years. So mm-hmm. no. <laughs> oh, she just said, no. I don't. Sorry. Never yeah. mind. Take revoking that one. Yeah. I think the the discussion around uh, long-term care is an interesting one just because it does seem like a way that a lot of people who don't have a ton of assets have them get wiped out and are unable to share share them with their family. I mean, that's something you see all the time. The medical costs, especially end-of-life medical costs in this country are outrageous. And so that's something that I think is really interesting, especially once again, people think their only solution is to you know, go get a high premium long-term care insurance policy. And they think that's the only solution. Right. If they could even qualify for it or pay for it to begin with, yeah. you know? And right. I mean, it's an uncomfortable conversation to have. And they say to themselves, you know, my kids, they're going to take care of me. You know, it's going to be fine. And so you end up not having that conversation until you're right at the cusp of needing to go into that facility and receive that long-term care. And that's the moment where, like, you're having to sell the house that has been in your family for, like, you know, two, three generations. And and it's all going to be paid to that facility. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and then the other thing that I'm going to say, just free advice for everyone. Um, okay. Something else that happens a lot is like, so there's two people are married and then a spouse passes, right? Um, the spouse that passed had a lot of individual debts, right? So they maybe had a credit card or they had some medical costs, right? But they're all associated with just that one person. Okay. After that deceased spouse, uh, is passed, the surviving spouse is going to start getting phone calls from that creditor. The credit card company will say, right? Hey, you know, uh, Bobby owed us $15,000. And I know he just passed. I'm so sorry. We, you probably don't have that right now. But don't worry. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to come up with a payment plan for you, okay? And so then you can just start making those lower payments. And then uh, eventually you'll pay through that 15000 I'm going to tell you, you need to talk to an estate planning attorney before you sign up for uh, owning $15,000 worth of your deceased spouse's debt, because there's a decent chance that you don't have to co-own that. If you didn't co-sign for it, you may not need to own it. What happens with student loan debt? I know it's not forgiven when people die. Well, it, it uh, may does be. it pass on? Well, it, if, it's, if it's just federal, if it's not private debt, but it's federal student loans that you never consolidated... Those under currently, those are discharged at death. The The mistake is that a lot of people, and it's not a mistake to consolidate your loans. It's just a mistake in understanding that they think that that discharge at death also works with consolidation. If you've consolidated your loans, those are not discharged at death. They survive you. You know, to just backtrack for a second on, you know, your comment and Laurel's, what we see happen a lot of times in the uncomfortable conversation around long-term care is actually really well-intentioned adult children who are making it impossible to talk about, not the mom or dad who are facing the care. Kids sometimes don't want to admit that caring for their parent is out of their hands. It's too much for them. So they'll say things like, mom, we're never going to talk about that because you'll always just live with us and it'll all be fine. 
So they never plan effectively. And then when mom's care gets to be too much for them to handle, when living at home is actually hurting mom, um, then she's got to move to a long-term care facility. And they could have done things very easily to prepare for that moment and not lose everything, the family business, the house, whatever. But because the really well-intentioned kids kept swearing, don't even talk, don't even talk about it. I will always take care of you. Now we've got a situation where we're losing valuable property for the next generation or even property that could be used to supplement mom's care for the rest of her life in the nursing home, right? Like a a moderate skilled nursing facility in Tulsa is going to be about $4,000 a month. So that's $48,000 for a year. And if you need memory care, almost double that. Yeah. About $8,000 a month. So $96,000 a year. So it's, it's a, you know, if you're, if you're one of those folks who it's, you're the first person in your family to own a house and an acre and have a little bit in savings that's gone in no time. Yeah. And that doesn't even get into the potential ramifications on, you know, your relationships. You know, if you're, if, if there's a group of siblings and, and one ends up taking the parent in, the others don't, you start to see, you know, potential resist resentment, the, the parent struggles because they feel like they're a burden. And so you end up having, potentially long-term damage to those relationships because of the lack of planning as well. And we see kids like suing each other, you know, mom or dad die and there wasn't a, an estate plan and everything's going to get divided equally after a probate. And the kid who did all the care is suing their siblings because they should get more for the five years that they put into caring for mom or dad. Um, right. It's really, I mean, I, I won't go into the details of it, but we've got a very recent case involving a, um, a family who happened to be black and uh, and the failure of one of the members of the family to do some effective planning um, has put grandkids at pretty major significant odds leading to a couple of years of litigation about things that could have been so easily solved ahead of time with the most, you know, just simple counsel from the right attorney. Um, but again, it was just kind of an approach that was a Fairly basic, pretty straightforward, not unique to that situation, and it created some some pretty rough situations now. So usually at Boomer Gang, Gang near the end of our interview, we we sort of one like ask what people what people can do to help, and this is a situation where there's very specific knowledge needed. Yeah. But if there was one thing everyone would know, as if any of these terms come up, is it the first thing to do is like call an estate lawyer first before any of these conversations happen, like. If children, for example, are willing to have these difficult conversations, what is the first thing they should do? Call us. No. Um, call call an attorney who focuses on estate planning and is willing to go to your entire family to talk to you together. Get your whole crew educated and on the same page. I We advise people not to, and so this is going to sound awful to some of our other attorney friends, so I will preface it this way. I am the worst attorney to call for anything besides estate planning. I don't know what I'm talking about. If you've got a family law issue, personal injury, criminal defense, if you call me and you've got a DUI, you're going to stay in jail for the night. I don't know what to do. I don't know who to call. I don't know how to get you out. So it's not, I'm not trying to criticize anybody by saying not every lawyer, you know, doesn't know everything. Okay. One of the mistakes we see people make is thinking that estate planning is kind of a boilerplate project. So they just call any lawyer they know to draft a will and it's done. In most situations, that's not going to be good enough. So you don't have to work with us, but there are some really good attorneys in town who focus on estate planning. Call one of them. I'm happy to give them shouts out. They're wonderful people. We're not trying to compete. And they should be somebody who doesn't charge your family for the conversation and who goes to your family to make the conversation as easy as possible initially so that everybody's on the same page. That's where to start. One of the barriers that anyone, not just people in some of the marginalized communities we've talked about when they're dealing with professionals that they don't understand a lot about is knowing the right questions to ask, whether it's medical, it's one of the barriers we see a lot in medical care, but I would assume it's similar in this, not knowing the right questions to ask so that you're getting the right information and right service from an estate planning lawyer. So what are some of those just sort of basic questions that you can ask to make sure that you're getting the right lawyer and the right information? I, I mean, so truthfully, I would say that the the first question that really you're probably going to ask is, is how much of your practice is estate planning, right? And and if they say, you know, it's it's about 70% 
or more, um, then hopefully that attorney is going to be able to help pull out the information. Really to be able to uh, like craft a good plan, a good estate plan, you're needing to know what is this person trying to accomplish and what are the concerns this person has. And so you just, you, you need somebody who is able to like get the client really comfortable and just like laying it out there, right? Like, I love my kids, but I'm really worried that my son is going to go back to his ex and she's going to take everything, right? Or I uh, love my daughter. She's wonderful. And I know that she would move heaven and earth for me, but she does not handle money well. It just flows through her hands like water, right? Or I love my kids so much, um, but I think that if I go live with my daughter, that my son is going to to hate the fact that I'm giving her money, right? Um, he's not going to understand what a caregiver agreement is, right? So hopefully that estate planning attorney is going to be able to pull out those concerns because that's really what they need. Uh, and they need the expertise to be able to craft a good plan. So your question is a good one, or it's an understandable one, but answering it would be irresponsible. So it, it shouldn't be on the client to walk into a meeting with 10 questions. It should be on the attorney to do a whole lot of asking questions. If I would say it's a red flag, if clients start meeting with somebody who just starts telling them what they need and how much they're gonna charge them for it, they're not talking to the right person. We always, at the beginning of our consultations, we say, do you have any questions? This is a good chance to answer them. But then we spend the next hour and a half or two hours just bombarding the clients with questions. The questions are ours, mm -hmm. not yours. And it, it's not, it should never be the client's responsibility. I don't care what community they come from to walk into that meeting and have the right questions. Um, and I'll just say, I mean, we've kind of flirted with it, but um, some really great estate planning attorneys in Tulsa that aren't us somehow, I don't know. A Brittany Littleton, Georgiana Marks, Stephanie Jackson. Oh, Stephanie uh, is phenomenal. Really, really great. Kathleen Pence. There's other great ones, but those are the ones that I particularly know. And if you said to me, I'm working with this person, I would say like, okay. You're in good hands. You're covered. All right. But yeah, the most, I, I, Laurel said exactly what I would say. The most important question a client could ask an attorney is how much of your practice is focused on estate planning. And if it's not at least two thirds, walk away. No. But after that, what you should be paying attention to is how many questions that lawyer is asking you. Mm -hmm. And if it's pretty few, gotcha. this is not going to be a good plan. And it sounds like being brutally honest is important with your estate planning. You, yeah, you can't. That sugarcoating or worrying about family members' feelings is not going to no. give you a good plan. And, and honestly, we've really, you know, I mentioned earlier that we have a home based practice. That's part of partly for that reason. There needs to be an open line of communication with the clients. And part of that is going to be the environment in which we're having the conversation. If clients are navigating downtown parking and then going up to the 20th floor and I'm sitting behind a mahogany desk in a three-piece suit, we're not going to have an open line of communication. That's an intimidating environment that lends itself to get in, get out. We want right. people to sit down you know, light a fire if it's cold. Let's get out some nice drinks. Let's sit here and let's let's chat. And it's it's in it's entirely because we want to create as much communication and disarmed communication as possible. If we don't get honesty, what are you afraid of? What about your kids do you love? And what about your kids scares you to death? And if you died, are you worried about your wife marrying the pool boy? And, you know, if you're the first person in your family to ever own property and you just know that if your son-in-law gets a hold of it, it's just going to go down the drain. You know, like those are important conversations. That niggling question in the back of your mind that in the middle of the night you wake up and you're like, oh, man, I wonder that that anxiety. OK, you need to be able to tell your attorney that. And I mean, so, yeah, family, money, death, disability. Those are none of those conversations are easy. And let's all put them together and have them at once. That's a big ask, <laughs> right? Especially if you've got one kid, like we had a client who adored both of her children in their early 20s. One of them was incredibly financially responsible. And one of them at 24 years old had already been in rehab for alcoholism six times. She, on the one hand, she felt like it was supposed to be her job as a mother to treat her kids the same. On the other hand, she knew that if she died and left her son half of her stuff, he would literally kill himself with the money. 
with the alcohol he would buy and the drunken stupor he would exist in. Ha being able to say, how can we help you love your kids effectively by treating them differently is important, but it also requires the client to be incredibly honest. And if we don't create the right environment, they're not going to be honest. One of the things that we do like to to ask towards the end to get get to know our guests a little bit more is about so over the especially during this last year of craziness what do you do when you're not doing your day job you know what do you what do you do to relax Jesse and I always call it what uh, our pop culture uh, junk food, you know what junk food. what are you binging what are you reading comfort food Chris what? it's comfort food pop culture junk comfort food, food. <laughs> I like junk food. Laurel's training for a rim to rim Grand Canyon hike. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Yeah. Well, and by that, I'm that is so impressive. I, I want to be able to hike the Grand Canyon without collapsing, collapsing in like a pool of like despair. I want to be able to actually like look up around me and be like, oh, this is great. Uh, and not have the Mounties and Rangers have to rescue me. Uh, hold on. I, I, yeah. This is a dumb question. So there's a way to be able to walk hike. From mm -hmm. one side to the other. There's right. not like a rope climbing. No. Okay. No, yes. that would be cool also. Also, the Canadian Mounties don't go to the Grand Canyon to rescue people. I, don't know. Mean, I was curious a little bit about yeah. that. I was like, did does the Grand Canyon stretch yeah, further I like, than I thought? Have we been invaded? Oh, you guys are so kind. No, not really. <laughs> but I like the I just, idea. I feel that, that I could possibly come. be so yeah. lost. They had to call in reinforcements. I'm like, Canada? <laughs> anyway. My wife is lost. <laughs> yeah. You're the, the only one. Please. <laughs> so I've been working on that. We call Canada for all of our emergency services. <laughs> Okay, so you're doing a very so, physical activity. So we're not activity. doing rigorous exercise. Yeah, doing, what else yeah. do you do to relax? I, I bake sourdough bread. Mm. She's pretty old. Oh. You know, do you know Kat Cox? She works a lot with Living Kitchen. Anyway, she's amazing. That yeah. place is amazing. I eat as a hobby. That's real fun. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so she she makes sourdough bread. I'm trying to follow in her footsteps. Sa we sourdough are. is the hardest of the breads to make because you have to keep that thing alive. Between yeah, between batches, right? I know I know all about sourdough bread. Laurel, Laurel is a nurturer, so the sourdough speaks to her. <laughs> did you carry uh, it around and talk? Did you carry it around and talk to it? That's what my dad does. So. Does he really? I mean, I don't talk to mine, but I know people name theirs. I don't have a name for mine right now. I'm just picturing that scene in Ghostbusters Two where they're all sit around like singing to the slime. Mm, yeah. yeah. Anyway. yeah. Um, I like that. I watched Ghostbusters too. That's who was. That was a good movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Underrated. Ghostbusters, two is, Ghostbusters great. is great, but two was fantastic. So, so what do you do? I, I'm a, I'm a bit of an amateur musician and I oh. play as much of that as I can. He does a lot of awesome musicking, but he wishes he could music for you right now. So Laurel and I are also like really big Brit box fans, oh. like the old mm. like 80s, That's embarrassing, 80s yeah. Yeah. BBC yeah. mysteries, Miss Marple and Poirot and a lot of that. Love all that stuff. <laughs> Um, Have you watched uh, Rosemary yeah. and Time? Oh yeah, Rosemary and Time is good with Shakespeare and Hathaway. <laughs> the most like I'm sorry, Rosemary oh. and Time is the most ridiculous British mystery I've ever heard of. <laughs> the way they shoehorn uh, somehow like the plant based <sighs> gardening, it's like ah yeah, the shoehorn gardening into every yeah into every murder. If you haven't watched, luckily I had learned about this one yeah. plant yeah. yesterday, I, and now it's, it's all the mystery, mystery of the murder. Yeah, <laughs> um, Shakespeare and Hathaway are similar. If you haven't watched that one. Like all the all the Easter eggs for Shakespeare plays, they drive all, right. all take place in like modern Stratford Avon Avon, and uh, so we 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 watched that, and then so Kuma, I really relate to Kuma because she talked about Forged in Fire, mm -hmm. um, and then she yeah. and I were talking today about after we binge Forged in Fire, we we discovered Blown Away. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, I was wondering about that. I saw that that was a suggestion yeah, on um, uh, on Netflix for me the other day. How's that? It's, it's good, but the it it like. The special place in our heart is, is still always going to be those, those silly BBC mysteries. Yeah. And I'm I'm on the board at the Osage Forest of Peace, used to be the Osage Monastery. Mm -hmm. And before all the COVID stuff, I had at least one day a month that I would go out there and have like kind of a meditation and reading day. I really miss being able to do that. Um, but I'd like to get back to that as soon as possible. That was, I feel a little bit off kilter. Um, but that's one of the things that I do to kind of stay sane with as busy as we are. Because we've got... Our Tulsa office, we've got Oklahoma City attorneys. We work in Seattle. We go back and forth between Oklahoma and Washington clients. And um, so it's there's a lot. We've got two staff members that work in our home. We're moving because we need a larger home office to kind of uh, deal with all of our staff. So there's a little kids, water leaks. Everything's driving us crazy. So Forged in Fire is a good place to just 
turn our brain off for a minute. Did you figure out what yeah. order to watch it in? Because Netflix had it in a very strange order that I can never, I can never it figure out. It doesn't matter. There's no storyline to follow. Okay. There's no right. trajectory. <laughs> well, like, you know, it's like with the, the British Bake Off, like there's judge changes and, you know. There, um, yeah, there are some judge. Yeah. Uh, the, the Ben Abbott came in at like seasons five and six, I think, because he was a previous two time winner. And they had a guy named yeah. Jay Nelson who was a, or Jay Nielsen for a while. But, so they were fun. But it's kind of like, it's like chopped. Like the whole, each episode is a one off. So you don't yeah. lose anything by, by watching them out of order. Except for the, uh, the Battle of the Branches. Uh, they had these five episode series that was like Army, Navy, Marines, and yeah. Air Force. And then the winner from each of those competing against each other. That was one to watch in order. But other than that, yeah, do whatever you want. No space force. Yeah, no space force. Surprisingly, <laughs> they're not they're not forging knives for space yet. Yeah, a little uh, dangerous with the suits, like aluminum knives. Yeah. I guess I don't know. I don't know no. what, what what they'd use, but lightsabers. Yeah. Come like, on, it's right there. That, yeah, I don't know. If that's forging, <laughs> but at some point the lightsaber competition will come out. Yeah. Well, you got to find the kyber crystal first, yep. and then you've got to bond with it. Yep. And then, wow, we're we, <laughs> we, we, we wanted to end this even nerdier than talking about yeah. estate planning. Yeah. So you're on, welcome. Like Lord of the Rings about it. Let's just yeah. dive into some talking. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I think we should keep uh, workshopping our uh, what Lord of the Rings either titles or chapter names or character quotes can be sexual innuendos as we as we went through <laughs> last week. So I, you know, I. I used to write under the name uh, Glam Drang the Foam Faux Hammer for my erotic memoirs. So <laughs> nice. <that's>, uh, <laughs> that is like that. next time we're, we're going to talk about how to pass on elven weapons yeah, right. through a state. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just you can't just, you know, give it give it to someone like there's a whole process. You really can't. Yeah, there has to be at least a worthiness criteria to the year state plan. We include a we include a Middle Earth property memorandum for our our state plans. (laughs) Good, good. Um, And usually, uh, whoever gets the thing involves a trial by ordeal at some point. So yeah, you know, like elves are like they're immortal that they'll need to a state plan. Wrong, wrong, (laughs) wrong. Jesse gets it. Jesse gets it. Because there are more. There are new generations of elves. Yeah. Also, like that's right. Yeah, they they can't die from illness, but they can still get stabbed, as we learned. I was just gonna say, retaining control is important when there's a one ring out that's there true. that can ru- rule your three rings. I'm just saying. So, power of attorney. Yeah. If Sauron had a power had a had a estate plan of what happened to the <laughs> ring after he died. It's one of our. It's one of the most important questions in our initial consultation. Is what's your precious? Yeah. You know? <laughs> mm. We got to identify your precious to know how yeah. we're going to build this thing. Right? Well, again, there, I can think of no better way of ending our interview than that. So, <laughs> Laurel and Riley, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you all for listening to our conversation with Laurel and Riley. To find out more about them, check out their website at www.tallgrassestateplanning.com, all one word. And make sure to follow them and Riley on Facebook. Riley is a hoot on Facebook. And I'm also happy to announce that after this episode, Tall Grass Estate Planning decided to become Pod for Good's first sponsor. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about them in the future. And of course, please follow us, Pod for Good, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And as always, get it done, Tulsa. Broken Arrow, get your act together and wear a mask. 